Hey, good evening, everybody. Thank you for, uh, for joining this evening's uh, trial club presentation. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm Bob Barnes, a member of the board uh, here with the trial club. I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Jim Lampros to get things started, um, you know, and, and hopefully we'll all have a great educational in, uh, you know, presentation today. Jim, I think you're still muted. Hey, can you hear me, Bob? I got you now. Okay, perfect. Hey, just uh, want to thank everybody for joining tonight. Pretty excited about this presentation. And um, Jerry Darkus, uh, who coordinates all of our events, could not join us tonight and asked me to intro Steve, which I'm uh, honored to do. Um, and I'll, I'll keep it brief, but want to make sure we do Steve justice. So. For those who are, are new to the club or don't have a history with Mr. Madewell, um, I can tell you that um, if there's anybody that knows the history of our fishery and um, I would say has done more for not only education uh, of the general angling public about the great fisheries opportunities we have here, but also um, has been directly involved in providing a lot of the access uh, to the tributaries and streams that we all enjoy fishing. Um, nobody that I know has done more than Steve. Um, and every time I get a chance to talk to Steve in whatever capacity, I learn something new about the history of the fishery, fishery um, the, the characters and the people who have influenced it. And, you know, really even something about these fish that I like to tell myself I know everything there is to know about. So, um, I know I'm going to learn something tonight, and I hope that everybody else is too. So um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Steve. Steve, I think we still have you on mute. How's that? That's much better. We got you now. Okay. Uh, you, do you have an echo? Uh, no, I do not. Perfect. All right. I was saying thank you very much, Jim, uh, for that um, introduction. I really appreciate that. And Sorry, Steve. We, we do actually have an echo coming through. Okay. Hang on a sec. Got it. We have a interesting experience here to talk about tonight with the the steel um, Are you still getting that echo, Bob? I am. Yes, we are actually. Yeah. All right. Hang on, just a second. Steve, I think you may be back on back on mute again.
All right. How's that? <laughs> we, we got you. Okay. Now, if we can get the, uh, the program back. All right. Thank go. you very much, Jim. And I'm sorry about this. Uh, I'm trying to juggle a couple things here. Um, but 35 years sounds, or 30 years sounds like a long time. 30 years in the alley. Three decades of chasing Ohio silver, but actually it's, it's really creeping up towards 40, I hate to admit. Um, but the Ohio Steelhead program and, and why, it's, why it's so remarkable. We're going to talk about that a little bit. And I know these are trying times with uh, you know, the, the Zoom meetings and whatnot, but I hope we can still have uh, a reasonably good time tonight. Um, so there's three essential components the way I see it. Uh, to the, this whole program and um, you know, we got population and public access, we got suitable water, we got the fish and the management and all of those have to come together to have some kind of success here. And so I'm going to talk about each one of those three components a little bit as we go along. And I'm going to talk about how they've changed from 1986 when I first started chasing steelhead in Northeastern Ohio. But first, let's talk a little bit about what is a steelhead. And I think most of us know that a steelhead is a, a, a form of a rainbow trout. And, um, you know, it's generally, and, and we know that they, they go from saltwater to freshwater. They're generally hydrodynamic shape. And, and because of their migration, some biologists um, believe that's one of the reasons why they have that that hydrodynamic shape. They're, they're geared for traveling great distances. And uh, they normally spend two to three years in the natal streams, um, or in some situations, maybe up to seven. And, and that two to three years is as important for us to think about. Um, when they go out in the saltwater, they stay out there for you know two to three years again. Um, they're multiple spawners. That means they can spawn, go back into the, the big water, and then return again. Um, they can mature in the big water, or in some situations, they can actually mature, mature in the river. And they can spawn in the, the, the fall, the winter, uh, spring, or in some strains will actually come up in the late summer. So it's really quite a remarkable fish. This is a picture of their, their life cycle in their native range. Um, you know, and it shows the spawning beds way up on the, uh, on the upstream portion of this particular river system. And after they spawn, they actually can produce resident, in ideal conditions, resident rainbow trout that stay in the stream and never leave. Um, some of the fish, though, when they develop into the par stage, they start to migrate downstream when they hit the smolt stage, which is about six inches long or so six to nine inches, the, the ones that are destined to go out into the ocean, they're heading out to the ocean. And, you know, they're going to return from the ocean in, in one to four years. And this little information was assembled by the Wild Steelhead Coalition. And I think uh, there's a, that's an interesting model to just watch and to think about, because these folks many, many years ago realized they had an incredible fishery and they needed to work together to try to protect that fishery. And um, there's been discussions and efforts to do that here in Northeastern Ohio and, and the Great Lakes. So the native steelhead range, you know, comes all the way from the Kamchatka Peninsula down through Alaska and all the way down into Southern California. Now that was the native range, the original range. And of course that's been drastically reduced on the on the west coast uh, some of the streams are, are in dire straits and have had tremendous reductions or even eliminations of, uh, of of returns and so let's let's talk just a little bit about the difference between native wild and stocked because when i have conversations with folks this this always comes up you know a native fish is a naturally occurring population of fish it's naturally occurring. It's been there. Uh, wild are naturally sustaining. In other words, they can reproduce and they can sustain their population. They do not need assistance from uh, human intervention. And a stocked fish is a population that's dependent upon supplemental stockings, you know, whether it's an annual stocking or whether it's occasional stocking. Um, 
So you can actually have a stocked strain of fish that ultimately become wild and they become naturally sustaining. They're non-native, but they're wild reproducing fish. So that's, it's just a kind of a general foundation to get your head around a little bit. So we're gonna talk a, a bit about native salmonids in the Great Lakes and why steelhead were such a big deal. Um, you know, of course, this is a brook trout. And by the way, this is the coolest, you know, this is a, a, a Native American mounting technique. And I saw these up in Ontario and up in Nipigon. And, you know, it's, it's so cool. It's the actual fish skin. It's, it's one half of the fish. It's stuffed with moss, sphagnum moss and whatever, and stitched onto a piece of birch bark. And I thought this was one of the most just absolutely lovely um, mounting approaches that I had ever seen. And of course, that was a brook trout. They were the most widespread trout in the eastern part of this continent. And unfortunately, about 91% of their original range has been altered and they've been eliminated. So there are very, there are very few places where they have, have continued to survive and remain as native wild populations. And one of the things that some of you I'm sure are aware about, you know, the museum and a number of institutions have been working with an Ohio brook trout that is a native wild fish. In addition to, and, and by the way, this is a great picture of a coaster brook. At one point they were widespread through Great Lakes drainage and they were virtually eliminated. Um, back in the mid sixties, the United States and Canada started working together to preserve one of the most unique strains of brook trout, and it's the coaster brook trout. Uh, they were um, once very common in uh, Lake Superior and were almost completely eliminated. The biggest brook trout on record was caught in uh, Nipigon Bay. And um, this is a, a Nipigon fish. And since the 60s, uh, mid 60s, these fish have, have started to stabilize and started to come back. And if you ever get a chance to go up there, Jerry puts a trip together. It's uh, Jerry Darkus. It's, it's a wonderful experience to go catch a brook trout of this size. And every now and then you get lucky and you catch one that's colored up like this. It's just spectacular. One of the other fishes, salmonids that was in the Great Lakes was uh, grayling. And of course they were uh, you know, eliminated. They were extinct by 1930. They were once common in Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and of course all through Ontario. And what a magical fish. Uh, if you ever get a chance to fish for grayling, um, it, it's, like, it's like a fairy or something. That, that giant dorsal fin, when it's in the water, and I've got that little inset picture down here, it, it's just a, it's a magical thing. You pull out of the water, the fin collapses because it's a, it's a very soft, it's a, a, a soft rayed fish. And so that dorsal fin just collapses and you, and you can't see it. You put it back in the water and it just magically reappears. Um, Interestingly enough, grayling were in the lower part of Michigan and were not in the UP. And um, they were eliminated from land use mostly and the introduction of, of brown trout. Uh, they outcompeted the grayling and they need very, very clean water. Another fish that was widespread through the Great Lakes, severely impacted by sea lamprey prey and petrochemicals, eliminated for almost all of the lakes by 1940, was the lake trout. And of course, there's reintroduction efforts for these fish that are underway right now, including the lake trout. And uh, New York is having some real success with this in the eastern basin of, of Lake Erie. And I, I have um, friends of mine that routinely go over and, and target these fish and, and, and uh, have you know, some remarkable days out on the lake. They've, they've done their homework. They'll catch 60, 70 of these guys. And you know I'm holding one down there in the bottom. This is a Labrador fish. Really, they can be quite old. That fish is, uh, is, is probably 10 years old or so. It's got a very large head, you know, thin body and whatnot. And then finally, and this was a real hoot. When I was putting this program together, you know, I knew that there were Atlantic salmon in Lake Ontario, but I did a little digging. I had no idea that Lake, the Lake Ontario population of Atlantic salmon may have been the largest concentration of Atlantic salmon in the world. Think about that. And they were gone by uh, 1898. And of course, there's a, a number of different restoration efforts uh, to restore all of these fish, including the Atlantic salmon. You know, but we're talking about a fish that came from the other side of the continent. And 
you know, one of the amazing things about uh, steelhead is is they're generally regarded as one of the top five recreational fish species in North America. So you take this fish from the Pacific Northwest, you bring it to the Great Lakes, it outperforms any freshwater fish that we've got here. They can go, according to the uh, Wild Steelhead Coalition, fish out of, out of the ocean can go from zero to 25 miles an hour in one second. Now, they argue that the Great Lakes steelhead might not be as vivacious as the, uh, the Pacific steelhead. And they may have a point there um, because those fish, anything and everything that can eat them will eat them out in the, uh, the ocean. So there is a, a selection process at, at, at work there. But steelhead have been known to jump 11 feet in the air. Uh, the, the oldest one that I was able to find any reference to was 11 years of age. And there's been reports of them weighing up to 55 pounds and, and up to 45 inches long. Uh, and that's in their native range. We lost many of these fish out of the Great Lakes um, because of land use more than anything else. So, some of it was overfishing or over harvesting. But for example, in Ohio, by the early 1900s, 87% of Ohio had been clear cut. And, and you see these pictures of these old um, uh, primitive uh, artwork, you know, with the barn, the kids sledding on the pond and whatnot, uh, or skating on the pond, sledding on the hill, no trees in the background. That is what it looked like. And and of course, that resulted in increased water temperatures, increased siltation, um, sedimentation, a host of, of, of problems. And <clears throat> back about that time, if, you, if you've seen um, Ken Burns' special um, about the national parks, he talks a great deal about these two gentlemen, uh, John Muir on the left side of your screen, uh, Clifford Pinchot on the right side, and they were committed to protecting and restoring and managing, but they both had different philosophies on how to get there. Um, and so when you think about Ohio and the fact that our state was clear cut, that even makes those brook trout even more remarkable. But it's an out, Ohio's an amalgamation of outdoor recreation experiences. Just a few, we did not have, just a few years ago, you know, we weren't known for fly fishing. Uh, just a few decades back, we weren't necessarily known for deer hunting or even turkey hunting. And those things have, have changed. And by the way, this is one of my heroes. This is Rosetta Zimmerman. She was uh, the first woman wildlife officer in the state of Ohio. And imagine the stories that she could tell, right? So after the clear cutting and the industrial use began to, to flourish, and of course, uh, streams and waterways were basically the, the place where you dumped your, your pollution. And of course, we all know, you know, what happened is in the 60s, the Cuyahoga River and many of the Great Lakes streams caught on fire several times. So how did, how did we go from having a, a river that routinely caught on fire to having blazing rivers to blazing fish? Uh, and it's really quite uh, a remarkable uh, story. You know, there was widespread environmental awareness um, in the 70s. People, you know, were very concerned about these things. Um, the Clean Water Act, for example, um, it, it was passed. It was vetoed by the president. The Congress got together and overrode the veto. Uh, imagine that happening in today's political world. It's hard to get your head around that. Um, but there was a shift in land use, and there was a accumulation of, of natural resource management techniques and a real a growing concern for the environment. And those things bode well for what happened in Lake Erie. Uh, you know, Lake Erie back in the, in the late 60s, early 70s was called dead. And, but suddenly, you know, a few decades later, we had this, what I call the rumble in the alley, 2002 to 2012, you know, things just kind of exploded. And that's again, that magic combination of the fish, the water and people and access. And this is about a, uh, eight pounds steel out of the Grand River. So let's talk a little bit about the, the fish. Going back to that terminology, they're stocked non-native. There are some wild fish in Lake Erie, I'm sure of it. Um, fish that have, have reproduced and every now and then you catch one, might have a little bit of a different shape, might have real crisp fins. If you catch enough of these fish, you get used to seeing them and looking at them and you notice differences about them. 
but it is in Lake Erie. Our fishery is dependent on 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 a stocking, an aggressive stocking program. Um, but that's not to say they're not wild in other parts of the Great Lakes. Uh, another interesting thing that that I I find a lot of folks uh, are fascinated with is Cleveland has a remarkable history with with fish stocking. Um, the Deus Garlic and Professor H. A. Ackley created the Dome Brook Fish Hatchery. In 1853, they performed the first successful artificial and fertilization of fish eggs in the United States. And they opened the very first fish hatchery in North America. Um, and so Ohio, uh, you know, back in the late 1800s, you know, there was a growing concern for resource management and, and, and whatnot. And um, Lake Erie got its first stocking of, uh, of trout from the U.S. Fish Commission uh, in 1883. Those were actual fish that were shipped by car, by rain, uh, rail, rail car. In 1885, they got their first shipment of eggs, and those were taken to the Castalia Trout Club and released into Cold Creek. Um, but, you know, there was, there was little, if any, uh, success that came out of that at all. Um, but Great Lake Steelhead have been around for a long, long time. Um, you know, as I said, they were first stocked in, in Lake Erie in 1883. Um, they were rainbows initially, but ultimately people began to actually start to transport fertilize eggs from the Pacific steelhead streams. Uh, Ernest Hemingway wrote about Great Lakes rainbow trout and steelhead uh, when he was uh, doing his reclusive writing in, in Michigan. So the Ohio story, the contemporary stocking story. You know, we started st stocking cohos in Lake Erie in, in the late 60s and, and all the way up through 88. We did kings in the Chagrin and the Huron River um, in the 70s. We, we tried to dally around with Browns a little bit in, in 74. Um, and then again, there was some brown stocked around the Geneva Marina in 87 through 89. But it was in the late 70s, when the Division of Wildlife had a banner year at their London fish hatchery of rainbow trout, and they decided to dump the surplus into Lake Erie. And they stopped stocking the kings uh, because of concern from landowners about dead fish in their backyards. Um, and they started to phase out the cohos, and that's why they started playing around with the London rainbows and they got surprising returns and it set some things in motion that enabled our fishery that we know today. The, um, the London rainbows were not a strain of fish from the Pacific Northwest directly. They had been reared in hatcheries for generations upon generations. And so their morphology was different. Uh, their behavior was different when they came in out of the lake. Um, they kind of had a football shape with a, a very small head. I'll show you a picture of one in a little bit. Um, and they started to become quite popular in their own way. And the state made a commitment to shift to manistees in 1991. Now, manistee stream are named after the Manistee River in Michigan. And they are more directly related to the Pacific Northwest than the London fish were. And they did their first stockings of Manistee in 1991 and a total shift in 1998. And they've completely gotten away from the domestic rainbows. Currently, we're getting eggs from the Manistee when we can get them, Chambers Creek and the Ganaraska uh, in Wisconsin. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, our stocking is regulated by the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission now. Lots came, uh, came to, to be since the early days of, of just dumping fish in the lake. This is all regulated by a joint fisheries commission uh, that, that um, basically everybody has, has negotiated and bartered for what their stocking ratios and quotas are. Pennsylvania was kind of first at the table and they got 900,000 fish that they're putting in their very small section of Lake Erie. Michigan stocks 100,000, New York 300,000, Ontario only 50,000, and Ohio 
generally we target 450,000 fish for our annual stocking. I'm going to go back to Ontario for a minute. The reason they selectively chose to only go with 50,000 fish, they felt that they had enough suitable waters up there that they could rear and create a wild, more of a wild, sustainable fishery. And so they really, they wanted to kind of hedge their bets and have the right to, res to stock 50,000 fish. But they have protected waters where you can't fish at certain times a year. They have hatchery waters where the, uh, the fish are protected. They can grow up to smolts and then go back down to uh, Lake Erie. And I've fished for some of this, this fish and it's really cool. Another little side note uh, to add here is Lake Erie is the most productive of all of the Great Lakes when it comes to fish production. And, you know, some folks have, have asked, well, did the steelhead, you know, did they displace anything? Well, you got to remember all of that clearing, all of that industrialization, all that pollution, you know, the over harvesting of, of, of things like blue pike, it left huge ecological niches in the lake. And I've always felt that steel had actually just kind of, you know, filled those in, you know, and, and that's just anecdotal on my, my part. Uh, but still, I think it's, it's important to remember Lake Erie is the most productive of all of the Great Lakes. There's more charter boat fishermen uh, working out of uh, Lake Erie than the rest of the Great Lakes combined. And so let's talk a bit about Steelhead Alley. Um, Steelhead Alley is a term that the first time I heard it, um, there was a fellow named Daryl Dent, and he was one of the founders of the North Coast Fly Fishermen. Um, he coined, I don't know if he coined that term, but it certainly was the first time I heard it. It was probably 87 or 88 when Daryl explained to me that Steelhead Alley was between the 20 and the 90 bridge. He said, whenever anybody asked him where he was catching fish, he would tell them in Steelhead Alley between 20 and 90. And I don't know if he came up with that term, but um, it certainly has stuck. And this is kind of what we're talking about. And this goes to the water. So we've talked a little bit about the fish. Let's talk about the water. What and where is Steelhead Alley? Again, between 90 and 20. And if you look, that's the, the entire uh, south shoreline of just of Lake Erie, just uh, west of Cleveland, all the way to, to New York. And if you take an inventory of the streams that are dumping into the lake, there is just a, a you know, a plethora of streams and they're, you know, all different sizes from the Grand River, you know, uh, Cataraugus, um, right down to uh, little streams like Arcola Creek that are dumping directly into the lake. And each one of those streams, each one of those waterways has a unique character, has its own timing, has its own clearing uh, tendencies after rains events, and, uh, and consequently it has its own rhythm and um, to the fishery that, that occurs there. And so there's a tremendous amount of options in Steelhead Alley in a few hours drive, either way. So there's all these streams. We've got these fish that have came back into this lake that was deeply suppressed. And then we've got this population and accessibility. So 2% of the US population fly fishes. And by the way, you know, fishing in freshwater fishing has, has grown um, remarkably in the past 20 years, and I've got some statistics to back that up, but there's hundreds of thousands of anglers within a two hour drive time of Steelhead Alley. Where I'm sitting right now, there's three and a half million people within 45 minutes of me. And if 2% of the US population fly fishes, you know, that's 70,000 fly fishermen within a 45 minute drive of where I'm sitting right now. And it just so happens we have some really great access provided by um, all three states, um, regional, regional governments and, and tribal governments. And of course, um, I'm most familiar with the regional metro parks and the tremendous access that they have provided. So if you've got water, if you've got people and you've got accessibility to these great fish, stuff's going to happen. And that's exactly what it took off. I had the privilege of meeting this guy and hanging out with him for <clears throat> a couple of days, Lonnie Waller. And you might remember that name or I've heard that name. He has some books and he also was the, you know, kind of the video star of uh, <clears throat> 3M's uh, ser video series on steelheading with a, uh, 
a fly rod. And, and Lonnie, to quote him, he told me steelhead alley is the new frontier of steelhead fishing. And I've got some of the, the nondescript flies that we use all the time that he and another of his, uh, one of his contemporaries, Deck Hogan, you know, Deck told me that a little guy uh, showed him what sucker spawn was on a trip in Alaska. And that Deck didn't know it, what he was talking about. Um, so what's changed over the past several decades with this magical combination? Well, the fish, for one, <clears throat> not so much they've changed, but in 30 years, we've learned a great deal about the fish. Now, this is going to, and that, by the way, Jim, this is not a picture of me. Um, I just thought I'd interject that before Lampros made some kind of comment on the chat. Um, <laughs> in the early years, as, as remarkable as this sounds, um, there was a big debate, ongoing debate, about whether or not these fish ate when they were in the spawning streams. And a fellow that I met, Fred Olson, he published one of the first books with information on steelhead fly fishing in Ohio, and he published that in 78. And the whole premise of the book was the fish have to be stimulated to strike. That, and this was not just a, a, an angler observation. Biologists believed, biologists believed that these fish did not eat in the spawning streams. Uh, Fred told me, you know, and remember, back then, you could uh, snag salmon um, back in the 60s and the 70s because the, the resource management folks did not think that they ate. Back in the 70s, Fred told me catching a steelhead on a fly was off in front page news. And he, he guided up in Michigan a lot. And, you know, I, I asked many of my buddies and whatnot, and Jeff Liske caught his first steelhead on a fly on 20-pound monofilament in 1977 in the Rocky River, and he was using a woolly worm. It wasn't a fly rod, but it was a fly. Uh, we've learned a lot about the fish, and we've learned a little bit more about the fish. Um, one of the things we learned, I'm going to go back to this. You might not recognize the fellow on the left. That's uh, uh, Senator, the late Senator George Voinovich and his fishing partner, Vince Panicki. Um, I had the privilege of fishing with George about 35 times or so. And I started fishing when he, when he was the governor. And um, <clears throat> one of the things that, that, you know, we're dependent on, we get fertilized eggs from Michigan or from wherever we can get the eggs now. Uh, for many years, it was from Michigan. And we reared them in our hatcheries. And the Castellia hatchery came on the market. And George asked me if, if um, he thought the state should buy it when he was governor. And I said, absolutely. And, and you got to understand, not everybody in Columbus was a big fan of the steelhead program. They saw it as an expensive program. They saw it as an exclusive program. Um, and so there were some uphill battles to fight there. But George basically told the director of DNR, if you don't buy this hatchery, if you can't make this happen, there's one too many people sitting in my office right now. So there's a little backstory to that. I'd be happy to share if you want someday. Um, but we've got the Castellia fish hatchery. And what that did is that assured quality water quantity capability of production and, and stability uh, for the steelhead program. So it was kind of like an insurance policy. Now all we got to do is get the eggs. And so the Castellia is a great, great facility. You know, the states put some additional resources in it, uh, but they have the capacity of, of growing many, many more steelhead than what we are allowed to stock by the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission. Um, in addition to learning about the ins and outs of the biology of the fish, the fish management's gotten better. Um, back, uh, you know, in the late 80s, um, you could keep five fish, um, and that's been reduced to, to two. And, of course, you've seen lots more people go into catch and release fishing. And as people have learned how to capture the fish and handle the fish and uh, have a different kind of expressed uh, appreciation for the fish, you see some different behavior. So, you know, our management now, we've, we've got to focus on a source for fish eggs. The strains is something that, that uh, you know, we can talk about. Um, the the uh, attitude that the anglers have adjusted, and of course, our knowledge is, has exploded with the internet, and people can Google up how to tie a sucker spawn or how to swing a streamer. And so there's been a whole lot of changes or variables that have come to play. Charter book guys have figured this out, too. And, and they still can catch a liberal amount of fish. And they, they figured out that if they sped up their 
walleye uh, uh, troll just a little bit. They could get a cooler full of walleye and get their clients happy with a cooler full of steelhead too. Uh, the question I'm always asked is, do they successfully reproduce? Yeah, they do. Um, do they reproduce enough to sustain the fishery that we've come to know and love? No, they don't. But this is a real nice size uh, smolt that was taken out of the east branch of the chagrin. So what's changed over the past several decades? The fish, the access has gotten better. Um, stream access, you know, when I started working at Lake Metro Parks in 88, we had, I think, 3,800 acres total. And when I left, the, the, the park system was well over 10,000. But Lorraine Metro Parks has continued to, do, to develop and buy property in the Vermillion and Black Rivers. Cleveland Metro Parks working on the, the Rocky, the Chagrin, and the Cuyahoga. Of course, Lake Metro Parks with the Chagrin, the Grand, and its tribs and shoreline. And Ashtabula County Metro Parks were kind of late to the game, but they were very successful in partner, partnering up with the state of Ohio. They passed a levy and they've really expanded their access on Ashtabula and uh, Conneaut Creek. But to give you an idea, you know, in 1980, this is what Lake Metro Parks map looked like of, of uh, properties. And by 2000, it looked like this. And, you know, you can see that's a lot of riverfront. And so in my tenure there, I was involved in getting about 26, 26 miles of stream frontage. Um, but in addition to streams, you know, folks have learned how to do the, the lake thing. Um, so we've got the chagrin, some dams. I don't, I'm sorry, I say dame in that. No offense to any lady that's listening. Dam removal. Uh, it's increased the capacity of these streams and it increased, uh, increased the accessibility um, with the Metro Parks and Cuyahoga Valley National Park on the Cuyahoga. Um, and of course, I, I mentioned the, uh, the lakefront. You know, Painesville Township Park has a really nice pier. People can catch steelhead and do catch steelhead on that. Another thing that's kind of came to fruition is, is technology has exploded. A lot of folks don't think about this, but you can actually do some steelhead uh, scouting uh, using Google Earth. And if you know anything about their behavior and about the kind of holding water that they prefer, you can actually go down a river and you can look at, um, uh, you can zoom in and you can check out an area like this and say, okay, I'm getting in my boat. I'm going to check that out. Um, the other thing that's that's had tremendous changes is our gear. Um, and this is a, a little cartoon character from the, the Curtis Creek Fly Fishing Manifesto, which is a great educational cartoon kind of book. But in today's world, there's so many books that are out there. But we've seen a tremendous evolution of gear and waders. Uh, the, the base clothing, your uh, fleece clothing, the rods and reels, uh, lines, leader tippet, strike indicators, all of these things have been driven by this available market here, which I think the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has recognized. The Great Lakes market is the third largest freshwater fish uh, economic market in the, in the nation. But the early gears, you know, graphite or glass rods. I mean, my first uh, steelhead rods were true tempered fiberglass rods. Poor drag systems like uh, Fluger Metalists, uh, mostly floating lines, monofilament leaders. Um, most people were wearing canvas waders. And then uh, the new neoprene waders, which if you've ever tried to walk two or three miles in neoprene waders, you appreciate breathable waders, cotton or wool clothes, uh, you know, a handful of West Coast flies, drought, uh, drought flies, glow bugs, and nymphs. Um, all of that's changed and shifted. I mean, I can recall, you know, the Big debate and the advance in the, the popularity of, of Polaroid glasses, uh, which were not really common in the early 80s, mid 80s and on our waterways here. The other thing that's happened is, is floatability. Um, many people have tried to do uh, clack of crafts in your traditional drift boats. They don't work so well, but uh, I bought my first raft about 16 years ago, 17 years ago, maybe even longer. And you, you see dozens and dozens of rafts out on the water, whether it's two man or three man. And you also see uh, maybe on a good spring day, there may be, you know, two dozen guides working the Grand River. And, and those are things that have changed. So we've got the fish, the access, the gear, 
the techniques. And if you look at this picture, you see these bears, right? Of course, at Brooks Falls. But I always like to tell people, you know, these bears are just like a dry fly fisherman, a nymphor, and a, and a streamer uh, fisherman. They're all using different techniques for catching their salmon. And the moral of the story is to use what works in the situation that you're best adept at. Um, so fly fishing for Ohio steelhead, and I'm trying to speed things along here. Um, by the way, that that's a mother. That fish ate a uh, mother that was greased up and as a dry. The first specific steelhead guide that I saw was 1992. Um, there was a fellow, uh, you know, we were influenced a lot by Michigan. Uh, the infamous chuck and duck running lines with slinkies. And uh, if you want to know what a slinky is, just ask me. But let's just say it was effective. It was an effective fishing technique. It was deadly to cast. Um, Bill Baker was the first guy that I met that had fished exclusively with a fly rod, exclusively for steelhead. He designed his own flies and he caught a steelhead out of the Green, Grand River system every month of the year. Not every year, but every month of the year he caught a steelhead. And this is a, a typical London fish. You can see how small the head is in proportion to its body. Um, these are a couple of Bill's flies, and you'll notice they were turned upside down because he didn't want the hooks catching on the shale. And so the one on the right is the Grand River Comet, and the one on the left was a squirrel tail streamer. Um, another guy that, that made a, a real contribution early on was this fellow on the right. That's John Bodner. And um, the fish man. And he was, he was the first person I heard do a presentation on what he called right angle indicator fishing. And that was using an oversized or an actual bobber to suspend nymphs and, um, and drift them through. You got to remember, I, prior to that, prior to seeing that, an indicator helped you see the line. It did not necessarily suspend your rig. And so John was the first person I heard do a presentation on this. Uh, led to what uh, Norm Himes used to call double trouble. And that was, uh, you know, uh, fishing with two flies under a suspended rig. You know, sucker spawn and the tiny flies flourished for, for several years. They had their, their day. And then Kevin Feenstra, a guide from Michigan, showed up. And he was tying these woolly sculpins. And he said, I might not catch as many fish, but when one strikes one of my four to six inch flies, it's a bone jarring experience. And so <clears throat> back in 2002, I did a tour around Lake Erie. I met this fellow in this picture. That's Rick Warwood. And I brought him back to the, the Museum Trout Club. He did, a, he did the first presentation in Ohio on spay rods. And so Kevin's big flies and Rick's big rod kind of started going together. And you, know, you saw a whole uh, new technique that was introduced. And it's continued to evolve uh, with, with swinging flies, different, you know, spay rods, switch rods, all of these different techniques have continued to evolve and, and change. And part of that is because the sheer numbers of people that are down here and going back to what Lonnie Waller said, uh, you know, Steelhead Alley is, is like the new frontier of fly fishing. You know, I always tell people, if you want to be successful, be one with a fish. And by the way, if you've never had a chance to catch one in the lake on a fly rod, it's, a, it's a, something worth pursuing. And you can appreciate just how fast these fish can move. But you, you, if you understand how they behave, their seasonal behavior, the spawning fish, the drawback fish, how water temperatures and, and the photo period influence all those things, you're gonna be much more successful. Here's a, a friend of ours, uh, Evan Morse, one of the uh, longstanding board members uh, for the trout club with a, a Lake Erie steelhead in the water, in the big lake. You know, so we've got fresh fish, we've got staging and spawning fish, of course, they all behave a little differently. Um, here's a, a, you know, a big buck that was a uh, drop back fish. They start to change their behavior. They put on the feed bag and start crushing flies. Uh, that are swung a little bit more readily. And if you understand the why of steelhead, then it's very helpful in, in picking the weapons that you're going to use or the techniques you're going to use to, to get them. I mean, I've got this whole box of nymphs here. If the water temperature is in the wintertime, it gets up to 48 degrees. 
you know, the riffles are going to be loaded with, with the stoneflies and, you know, prince nymphs and, and stoneflies are going to tear them up. Um, you know, if you've got fish on skinny water, small streamers is a very effective way to go. And there's a gazillion guides that will give you this information much better than me. But as a general rule, you know, for low and clear, small water, way forward, floating lines, uh, big water, this is where this change has occurred. You got a lot of fellows throwing spay rods, single handed or, or uh, and they're using um, single handed switch rods, uh, floating lines, weighted lines instead of um, excessive amounts of lead shot. Um, sinking tip and sinking lines, um, flat dead water strip weighted flies, um, you know, under floating lines with a, a big oversized indicator and a, 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 a dropper. And you can catch them, like I said, even on a dry when the conditions are right. Like right now, uh, lower sections of the river, this is perfect time of year, perfect conditions to, to try to get a, a, a steelhead on a dry floor. The other thing that's um, remarkable is, uh, you know, we used to all call each other. And Bill Baker was the first guy that I came across that that said, OK, if we get a two inch rain, our Gola Creek is going to be clear at 12 to 18 hours. The small trips will be clear in 18 to 30 hours. The Grand River may be off for another five days, but the Shagrin should probably clear up in two or three days. And he, and he kind of you know, came up with some general guidelines to monitor and watch this stuff. But now we can go to the USGS uh, or River Boss uh, websites and you can look at flow rates and you can record the flow rates on a day you have a good day. That's what your target number is. And then, of course, there's all these user boards that are available on the internet. So this is a big shift in how we go about catching these things. There's a wealth of information that's available uh, through publications. And, of course, the center book is, is Jerry's Essential Flies of the Great Lakes Region, which is probably the best all around all purpose uh, fly book that's available. Uh, the one on the right, of course, was uh, you know, the Custich Brothers Great Lakes Steelhead, which is a classic. And so there's all these things that are out there. Of course, there's the angling clubs. The notion of us working together like the Wild Steelhead Coalition out on the Pacific Northwest, I have a dream of all the clubs and organizations getting together to share information, both anecdotal and, and scientific uh, research that would help us learn even more about these fish and maybe how we could promote their successful reproduction or their sustainability on a, on a, uh, on a, on a higher level. And, you know, in closing, I'm gonna offer a couple observations. Why is this important? You know, when it gets right down to it, there's a huge economic impact. Uh, the outdoor recreation industry is like $887 billion annually. And, you know, I have some, information from 2003 um, for PA, but actually there's been studies done in 2016 that indicate that PA had 539 full-time job equivalents in Lake and Erie County alone. Um, they estimated that their economic impact from steelhead fishing in Erie County, Pennsylvania, $454 million. We don't have that research in Ohio and it's unfortunate um, because I think it's really important for our state. Um, and if the clubs can work together to help promote that awareness and that appreciation, the economics is certainly one element. And of course, something that I think registers with all the anglers that, that I know, or most all of them, is fly fishing. I think we recognize it's a gateway to conservation. It, it brings about a higher level of engagement and the out of doors. And by the way, fishing is the second most popular outdoor activity behind jogging. More people fish than play golf and tennis combined. More people went fishing last year than attended all of the NFL games. And of course, this is from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife's uh, five year survey that they do. Um, so, gate, uh, fly fishing is a gateway to conservation, it brings about a higher level of engagement. You're, you're encouraged or almost forced, if you want to be successful, to understand the habitat and the behavior and the ecological relationships between habitat and behavior of the fish. And it leads to a higher level of support for local, regional, and state conservation efforts. And of course, those things tie to national and global efforts. And I guess another reason why it's, it's important, we, we not only care about the environment, but one thing that, that started to come out of this whole fly fishing deal and in Northeastern Ohio, in Ohio, is we've started to create a sense of tradition. 
and a sense of tradition leads to a much brighter future. And so with that, I'm going to shut up and uh, see if there's any questions out there. But thank you all so very much for uh, listening to me. And I hope that maybe there was some thought provoking uh, bits of information shared. Here. Hey, Steve, it's Jimmy. Yeah, Jimmy. You still got it, you old frog. <laughs> well, great job. Well, no, thanks. there was some great stuff in there. Um, one of the things I was thinking about listening to you talk, just curious, um, in your observation, I think you have more tenure, if you will, on the streams and with the fishery than maybe anybody on the call, which is probably why you're doing the presentation, but if you had to say, what do you think um, in recent years, especially let's call it post COVID, what is the one most significant or noticeable change you've seen and observed on the streams? Um, well, from your perspective, you know, I, you know, I got a little statement from DNR um, last year that um, you know, in 2019, they raised and they stocked uh, substantially more than the uh, 450. They had a banner year and, and uh, they stocked 586,000. So there should be a good return this year. Um, I, I thought it was interesting seeing the behavioral changes in some of the different strains last year. Uh, I thought that was, that was kind of fascinating. I, I think, you know, I talked to some other people and, and of course this is anecdotal. This is just, you know, you go out and catch a fish and you say, Holy smokes, that fish seemed to do some different things, you know? Um, but, but I think there's something intriguing about that. Um, I would say that the fall fishery from, from my observation, and it was kind of confirmed by this statement that I got from the, uh, the, the state that, in 2019, the recreational harvest came from the central basin was below the 10 year mean with harvest and release rates a little bit lower than they've been in the past. And I think there's a lot of folks that that have been, you know, talking a bit about um, reductions in 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 their catch rates in the fall. Um, and I would I would say, you know, again, that's that's anecdotal, but it seems to hold true. I mean, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not talking to anybody that's having at least well up into the waterways banner days in October. And I haven't for a few years and whether that's, that's a, that's a strain phenomena, whether that's, uh, you know, weather related, uh, whether there's, I mean, there's so many variables, Jim, uh, you know, with, with, you know, is it, a shift in angling pressure from the, the charter boats from the cormorants. Uh, is it the strain thing? We just don't know. And, and I think that any biologist that, that, that is honest is going to say, we don't really know. And, and for me, that kind of begs the question, why wouldn't we be committed to doing really more committed research? Yeah. Um, Great answers. And I think good segue maybe to the second question I was going to ask, because uh, near the end, you mentioned, and I would agree that um, fly fishing is a, a great gateway to conservation. So for those on the call, and we've got a nice turnout tonight, I'd be curious in your opinion, who, you know, somebody who's been involved in conservation uh, in every which way that you can be for a long time, how would you encourage uh, those on the call, like, what do you think is a good way for people to get involved and have influence, um, on the future of the fishery? Well, you know, one of the things that, that I think is real important is, um, I think it's real important to go out fly fishing for bluegills. You know, I think it's real important to go fly fishing for bass. I think it's real important to go out and, and figure out how to catch a carp on a fly. I mean, I, I think that those things um, leading to a, a greater diversity leads to a greater understanding and appreciation for the waterways that we have and the tremendous resources that we have around here. 
And I think that steelheading, it, it, it can be pretty intimidating. And if you want to introduce people to fly fishing, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it was so much easier back in like 1998 to take somebody steelheading for the first time because there was gazillions of fish and very little pressure. Um, but, you know, take them out in different times, different places, and, and, and try to become more of a 12-month angler. Uh, and if you're spending time on the stream in the summertime, it's only going to help your steelhead fishing anyway, you know, but, um, I, I, so I would think that, you know, trying to get beyond, you know, being a one dimensional, one dimensional angler is a, is a good, is a good thing. And it makes it more accessible, I think for year and around and for different interests and whatnot. Um, and I think that, you know, you started to see people do some really cool things like, um, become more avid photographers and there's spinoff things that, that introduce people. I mean, I, I know that we've all had that question. How in the world can you go stand in freezing water, you know, when it's snowing or sleeting and you think that's fun. And it's a, it's a, <laughs> of course, it's a hard thing to respond to, but the fact of the matter is, you know, you're feeling so uh, in a zone. And if, and if you can share that with somebody in less than um, challenging conditions, it's a great way to introduce people to the outdoors. That being said, you know, fly fishing has had a, a real boom. I mean, um, in the late 80s, when I would go fly fishing, I literally, for, I could count on my hands, on my fingers, the number of people that, that I knew that were fly fishing locally in the late eighties and early nineties. I mean, it really exploded in the, you know, as, as the nineties came along, but when I get out of my car with my fly rod and people just kind of stare at me like, what are you thinking? Um, and, uh, so that's really came a long way. Steve, we've, we've got some, Hey, can I interject real quick? We've got sure. some, uh, Questions coming in through the chat, one of which maybe segues nicely here, uh, you know, going from the increase in, in fly fishing to ever more specialized versions of the sport. We got a question about, uh, you know, Euro nymphing for steelhead. If, if you have any experience, know a lot of people who are doing it and then any advice on, you know, what kind of rod, you know, rod weights to, to look, look into it, it, fishing in that style. You know, I would I would defer that to to somebody who's an expert in that kind of uh, you know technique or those kind of uh, approaches. What I can tell you is that um, you know the the big the big boom in tankara fishing. Um, I I found that to be really intriguing because um, by default that approach to fishing forces you to become a more intimate in a more uh, target specific um, angler. And, you know, going back to Jim's question about how do you introduce somebody into fly fishing or to the sport, uh, you know, there's a lot going on with fly fishing. And, you know, people get intimidated by casting, by, you know, what sounds like routine information for, for an experienced angler sounds like jargon uh, to somebody that's a novice. And so when you see these, these, specific evolutions come out like uh spay fish spay rods it gives somebody a, a, a whole new avenue of things to explore and whatnot but it becomes much more it becomes that much more uh, um, specific and that more and much more intimidating to a, a beginner and being caught up in the technique can actually take you away from understanding the fish and how to catch fish and so the, the, the Euro nymphing uh, techniques are so effective because <laughs> they, they work for the fish. It's, it's, it's not about the casting. It's about catching, you know? And, and so, um, the, you know, it, it's again, going back to that, knowing the fish, knowing the behavior and, and understanding yourself, what your objectives are, are you know, do you, do you want to have the most beautiful long distance cast? you know, or do you want to, you know, catch a bunch of fish and, uh, not saying either one of those 
is less valuable of an experience. And I, I, you know, so I would say if you want to know more about Euro nymphing, find somebody that can that can give you that specific information. That's good at it and and knows what they're talking about because I can't. Good, good, uh, good commentary, Steve. A couple more questions here in the um, in the chat, mostly about you know steelhead themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got one. Uh, you know, is there are there? Do you know of any initiatives to institute catch and release sections? You know, within the Ohio River. Uh, no, I. Um, you know, I I attempted to do that twenty years ago or so, and uh, working. You know, tried to float that balloon with the state and. Uh, there's a lot of apprehension about alienation of the angler base. And, um, you know, I, I think that some of those apprehensions may change and, 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 and shift over time. Uh, but I'm not aware of, of any uh, concerted effort, um, whether or not, you know, that couldn't be broached again. But I, I did have, uh, you know, several set down meetings and, and wanted to try to, uh, be the front agency at Lake Metro Parks of having some catch and release water, and it just did not go anywhere. Uh, some more questions. Uh, is there a feel for what percentage of stocked fish, you know, make it back into the rivers? You know, back um, many years ago, Bob, I had, I had followed that. Um, I know that at one point um, there was estimates like 10% now, but this, remember, I, I'm, I'm, let me qualify that by saying we're, we're talking, you know, over 20 years ago was when I was um, kind of poking around with those numbers. And it was really remarkable because I happened to be on a trip in Ireland and I was talking with their natural resource management people over there and, um, and was asking them about their return rates on, on their, their Atlantic stocking salmon stocking program mm -hmm. and when i told them what we were getting in, in lake erie i mean these guys it just like was mind fry for them they were like you've got to be kidding me because we they don't have the predation mm. you know uh i mean we don't have the predation that you know an, an ocean going fish does yeah. um so i don't know what the what the current rates are uh, but that would be again that would be a really good research um, yeah yeah and, you know, likewise, on a similar subject, um, you know, any any ideas on, you know, the reproduction success rate? There hasn't been any, uh, you know, these are these are hard. These are hard, hard research questions. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying they're hard questions to what I'm saying. They're questions that require hard science. And there has not been the economic commitment. Um, you know, to pursue that, um, you know, they're costly, costly studies. Um, and in some instances, I don't know if it's still the case, but I know, you know, years ago, there was a reticence from the state to do some of this research because it was almost like they didn't want to know. Yeah. Um, because, you know, there, you get into these, these questions of, well, if, if these fish are reproducing in this, this stream, should that stream be a brook trout stream? Or if they're reproducing in that stream, are they displacing, you know, red-sided daces or salamanders? You know, I mean, and, you know, we've got our value system. Everybody's got their value system. And, you know, it, it takes some process to work through questions like that. And you have to be committed to wanting to know what the answers are and being comfortable with, you know, what that might yield. And I, I, I hate to sound like a politician, uh, but geez, uh, yeah, or, or maybe I, uh, I shouldn't say politician. Maybe I should say, I, I hate to sound like a bureaucrat. Uh, cause I guess that was what I was closer to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's, there's always a lot going on with this stuff. Yeah, you know, and we last year we had a couple of people from you know talking about some of the research programs on other chats or on other uh, presentations. Uh, anyone who's interested in hearing, you know, some people from the state maybe speak about that. You can go to our YouTube channel and 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 see maybe not exactly answers to those questions, but at least some of what you know Steve's talking about with the 
you know, the investment in the research and, and what really goes into the research for some of these questions that we're talking about. Yeah, you, you, I mean, you know, these are, these are, are serious. I mean, it requires a serious commitment of time and resources. If you wanted to say, if you wanted to try to do a reproduction uh, assessment, um, you know, you'd have to, you know, and, and there's multiple agencies that could be involved in that, but just the coordination of that alone is, is a job. And, and then the field work is a job. Um, so it's, it's, there's a lot of work involved and it's costly. Uh, but man, I, I, you know, for me, that's the kind of stuff I'm, I've, I've always been fascinated with. Well, Steve, you know, thanks on behalf of everyone here. Thank you for your time tonight. Um, I will say you've kind of set me up to make a uh, shameless pitch here at the end of our, uh, <laughs> <laughs> at the end of our uh, presentation. But uh, I do want to remind everybody who's on the line that uh, we do have uh, the club's you know, really only a major fundraiser uh, for the year coming up in a couple of weeks, October 29th, the uh, Museum Trout Club will be uh, bringing back the, the annual Steelheaders Ball. Uh, I encourage everyone to join us for a tremendous evening of, of music and fun and support for these fisheries that, that, you know, Steve talked about this evening amongst other op options. Um, Google Steelheaders Ball, you'll find our ticket, uh, our ticketing site. Uh, it should be your first, uh, <clears throat> your first result. Uh, also on our social at CMNH Trout Club, um, you can you can buy tickets there. But definitely hope everyone can can join us because it's going to be a great evening. Steve's put together an amazing band, and and it's it's for a great cause. So. Um, Steve, with that, thank you for your time. Everyone, uh, have a good evening, and hopefully we'll see you in a couple weeks. We'll see you. Thank you. Great job, Steve. Thanks, Jimmy.